So in my last three years, I've kind of encountered the reality of talking about this. Um, so that, this is how this presentation came to be. Um, really quick, I'd love to hear, I usually, in a lot of my activities, do what I call a whip, where you get, say one word that captures why you came to this workshop. So maybe five people, you can just raise your hand and just say one word that captures why whatever this is called. This title is probably a little different than what's broadcasted, but why a workshop on cultural appropriation? So a, couple, a few volunteers. So actually, you're, in addition to the one word you're going to say, just say your name and institution so I can get a sense. Mm. Gotcha. Cool. And what institution? Biola. Biola. Cool. My name's Mariel. I go to Wheaton and white rappers. Instead of okay. White rap. I got a little bit of that in here. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's hot topic. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? My name's Sarah. I'm from Seattle Pacific University. <clears throat> and what kind of gave me to this is probably the student government. Okay. Great. Anyone else? One, or one more, one, two more? OK, that, that works. <laughs> cool. Um, so this is what I, I actually presented this. I'm involved with a kind of regional network. It's called CACHE. It's the California Council for uh, Cultural Centers in Higher Education. I presented this actually last summer at a workshop. I was actually at UCSD. Um, and it's basically multicultural centers in California. We get together and just support each other. So it's kind of a regional-based network. Um, and we kind of talk about trends. And so I presented this then. Um, and I just kind of adapted a little bit to, to today's, to this conference. Actually, Glenn asked me to present this because Glenn was at that conference too. And he said, I think this would be a good addition to SCORE. So um, I said, sure. So a thin line between love and hate. Does anyone know where that comes from? A song. A song? <laughs> That's what happened last time I presented. I was like, I didn't know that it was a song, <laughs> but I learned. Yeah. Anyone else? It's a movie. Yep. So, oh, I'm just going to scroll down here. This is the movie. I grew up in the 80s and 90s. Martin, so I grew up on Martin Lawrence, Will Smith. But this is, I remember, I remember this, this, this movie, and um, I just used the name of the movie, just letting you know where it came from, in, in case you're wondering. But this quote kind of summarizes the difference between cultural exchange and cultural appropriation. So the concept of it being a thin line, it's kind of like you know, there's a thin line between many different things, love and hate. And in this case, I don't know the film very well, but the story was Martin Lawrence. He was in a relationship with this woman. And then it became very hateful very quickly. right? It's, it looked like love. And then once the line was kind of like flirted with, it soon became hate. So I just used that tagline, apparently a song. Who sings the song? That's OK. A thin line between love and hate. It's a concept that I so I just used the title for that for this uh, for this workshop. Um, so this this next slide just talks about. So I think I just want to also talk about the name of the workshop, naming cultural appropriation. I want to talk really briefly about the power of naming. So when you name something, it almost like identifies what that is, and then you can start to recognize it and address it. Correct. So a, an example I can think of that is more related to this work is the term microaggressions. Raise your hand if you've heard that term before. It's, it started, it's actually been researched a long time in coming out of critical race theory, looking at some of those things. But once you name something in a community or in a campus or in academic circles, you begin to be able to recognize it more. So um, the example of microaggressions, and I think there's a couple presentations on this. Christina Lee Kim, I think, teaches psychology here. I think she's doing a I know she did at SCORE a couple years ago a workshop on microaggressions. The power of naming something allows you to see it. This is the only example I can think of. I used to drive a Toyota Corolla for a long time. And then when I bought that car, my dad you know, knew that I had this Corolla. And then he's like, Jason, I start seeing Corollas everywhere I drive. Right? You start to see it. It's not necessarily naming, but you're more conscious of something. And you, you're able to see it, address it, things of that nature. So the power of naming. Um, is part of one of the takeaways of this workshop. Because um, sometimes it's, it's like certain forms of racism, whether they're covert or overt, you see, you see them, sometimes you don't know how to recognize them. So I think naming 
a specific form of that in cultural appropriation allows you to recognize it. So cool, I'm just gonna give a little bit of historical context about this concept of cultural appropriation. It says, we are seeing more and more examples of cultural appropriation ranging from blatantly racist themed parties to subtle microaggressions in the form of disingenuous celebrations of cultural identity. This workshop will review common trends on our campuses in recent history and discuss best practices in naming, addressing, um, and creating awareness and education around our college campuses, around these issues that negatively impact our campus climate and sense of socially conscious and socially just communities. This workshop will include discussion in hopes to specifically highlight the power of naming something in order to identify, deconstruct, and educate our campuses. So, kind of recapping what I just said. And then I talked about, it'll, we're going to look at some examples that have happened in our country and even locally here. Um, and I would say this came up for me in my work. I've been at Westmont for three years, and I'll go into this example. Within a couple months of my job, it was like, came and slapped me in the face, and it was like, how do we respond to this situation? So let's just jump in. So a definition, if you look at the word appropriate, um, it says to take or use something, especially in a way that is illegal, unfair, etc. Another definition, to take or make use of without authority or right. So I heard one example someone mentioned, maybe the appropriation of hip hop or rap. And that's a conversation that's happening, I think, in pop culture right now a lot. Um, so you see that happening as one example. I would also throw out another word I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, it's commodification. Does anyone know? Can anyone help me define that? What are, what are your thoughts about that term, commodification? Making something that shouldn't be sold into something that's like traded and mm -hmm. bought. Okay. That's good. Any other thoughts? When I first heard that word, I was like, whoa, that's, that's a really big word. I don't know what that means. I just think of the term commodity, right? You're making something a commodity, a hot commodity, um, whether it's a fashion trend, and you see that in culture a lot, um, or you know, whatever, someone's culture becomes really popular all of a sudden. So looking at the terminology of appropriation, I'll talk about commodification a little bit as well, but specifically this concept of appropriation. Um, I was actually, I have a roommate, he's my colleague here, and I was like, oh, I'm doing a presentation on, on cultural appropriation. He was like, so you're talking about what's, uh, I forgot what he said, but he was like misunderstanding. Um, he was like, what's appropriate culture or not? I guess it's part of, it's part of the language, but. Um, so this is, I'm going to highlight a resource here. There is a book up here. It's called Who Owns Culture? Defining Cultural Appropriation. So from this book, um, Susan um, Scafidi says, taking intellectual property, traditional knowledge, cultural expressions, or artifacts from someone else's culture without permission. This can include unauthorized use of another's, another culture's dance, dress, music, language, folklore, cuisine, traditional medicine, religious symbols, Etc. It's most likely to be harmful when the source community is a mi minority group that has been oppressed or exploited in other ways, or when the object of appropriation is particularly sensitive. For example, sacred objects. So that's what uh, Susan said in her book. So if you want to, if you're if you're really interested in reading more about this, you can write her name down. And the own the um, title of the book is Who Owns Culture. So that's uh, the book that she wrote. So I found found that to be a, a helpful resource. I talked a little bit about this, the reality of a thin line. You know, it's really challenging where we draw the line of um, what's, how cultures are represented in many ways, um, and does it cross over from what well, we'd say cultural exchange to cultural appropriation. Um, so we're going to just jump in. So talking, we're going to talk a little bit about, I'm trying to illustrate what the reality of that thin line is. Um, a while ago, there was actually an article, you may recognize this, you know, the day and age of social media, there's BuzzFeed. I think this might have been like a BuzzFeed article. I think it might have been on a website called Everyday Feminism, which is becoming a voice around a lot of social justice issues. Um, but this is from a, a blog post from, from this um, person. And I thought they taught, this illustrates the reality of the thin line. It says, from then, uh, and then there are people who believe that everything is cultural appropriation, from the passing around of gunpowder to the worldwide popularity of tea. They're tired of certain forms of cultural appropriation, like models and Native American headdresses, being labeled as problematic, while many of us are gorging on chipotle burritos, doing yoga, and popping sushi into our mouths with chopsticks. They have a point. Where do we draw the line, appropriate forms of cultural exchange, and more damaging patterns of cultural appropriation? To be honest, I don't know that there is a thin, straight line between them. 
But even if the line between exchange and appropriation bends, twists, and loop-de-loops in ways it would take decades of academic thought to unpack, it has a definite starting point, respect. Um, so respect um, is a huge piece in evaluating, you know, is this a cultural appropriation? But I think I like this quote because, I mean, they talk about, or you see they're, they're talking about um, popularity of even food. You know, there's things that become really trendy. You know, boba had its run. Maybe it's still really popular. Yo, I don't know, Froyo, which I think came, you know, Pinkberry was a Korean company. And these things tend to be trendy. But it doesn't make it necessarily wrong or, you know, misappropriation. It's popularity. I mean, I don't think the creators of boba are complaining that they're making a lot of money now or whatever. Um, but it's just this, it's looking at the reality. Some people will be on this extreme where everything seems to be appropriation to them. Um, and then some people will perhaps like really deny that there's any um, misrepresentation, misappropriation of culture. Um, so it's really understanding where that line is and how to draw it. And I don't know. I would say in this presentation, I'm going to ask a lot of questions. Um, for me and my work, I, I think I've had to ask a lot of questions. I'm like, I'm not really sure about is this cultural appropriation or is this not. So I'm going to. You may not come away with like, oh, I know how to solve cultural appropriation. I know the answer. But I'm just gonna allow, um, allowing us the chance to ask questions. Um, and I think, again, to go back to the title of it, it's naming it, the power of naming something and being able to be conscious of it. So I'm just going to jump in here. The, uh, the first example of where we are on this thin line, and this is in media a lot, it's, it's mascots, right? Um, and this shows a wide array. I kind of position these very specifically. Um, you know, is there a difference between mascots that are of actual tribes? So the native indigenous uh, mascot situation. So the ones here on the left, uh, I won't even verbally say it. I've kind of heard some people, like I'll just say the skins for short because it's not the full slur. Um, it's a histor it has a historical context of being a slur. Um, you know, the Cleveland Indians also, I think, kind of blatantly just kind of stereotyping Indians in general. Versus, I think, you know, some of these mascots are of uh, more tribes specifically. There's people that have, there's a history of a conversation with those communities about um, representing them in their mascots. Um, I wrestle with it because it's a mascot and it's kind of like, if you look at the definition of mascot, it's kind of like a good luck charm for your, your team, your sport, which to me in some ways I believe, you know, can be, I mean, it's kind of minimizing to someone very, that's very close to your personal identity. Um, so, and then to push it even further, to go to the other extreme, this is where I wrestle more, I would say I wrestle with this. I was, I was literally thinking about this. I'm a huge sports fan, so I was thinking about, because um, I, I felt like it was quite dehumanizing to see your personal identity represented in a mascot in general. Um, but then I thought about, so the second question, can an argument be made for appropriation of mascots of dominant culture? Um, so I was thinking, Notre Dame, Fighting Irish, one of the most marketed, probably, mascots in, in uh, the United States, um, Irish. And I think there is a historical context of marginality for Irish immigrants into the United States. So do we ever hear anyone complaining about these two? They happen to win the Super Bowl. This is the old Patriots uh, logo. Um, I don't think I have ever heard anyone complain about that. Um, it's in dominant culture. It's representing racially, per, you know, perceivably white identity. Um, so there doesn't seem to be as much issue there. But it is, I would say there is some history of marginality for, you know, <coughs> Irish and Italian immigrants to the United States. So just throwing it out there. So take a moment and maybe people around you to talk about even mascots and what your thoughts are about these couple of questions. So talk amongst yourselves for a couple of minutes.
right, we're going to bring it back. So you can wrap up your conversations. Great. Does anyone, does anyone want to share maybe some highlights from the conversation specifically to these two questions? I'd love to hear some, some people's conversations. What were your thoughts about these questions? Anyone over here? Well, I think it's interesting that you have the Fighting Irish up, because we're from South Bend, and Notre Dame is oh, yeah. located in South Bend. And I used to work for Notre Dame. And so I know that their mascot is not um, a costume. They actually have a person. Mm -hmm. He is short with red hair. Like, he has to have red hair, a red beard. And so working there and just growing up in the area, you don't hear people complain sure, sure. about so can I ask you a question, Gina, Gina is your name? Mm -hmm. Did you ever, have you ever even heard anyone just even question whether it's appropriation or it come up in the conversation? No. Okay. So these are my own thoughts that I was just like wrestling. I was like, I'm going to put this on my presentation because <laughs> I was like, so you always have to put yourself in the shoes of the, the identity, right? So, so f you know, for me and my personal identity, which by the way, I'm, I'm half Korean, half Chinese. Chirene is what I like to call it. Um, not many blended uh, multi-ethnic Asians that I've met that are half Chinese, half Korean. You know, if I saw my own culture being represented, you know, I like well, okay. So as a Chinese person, how how does this affect me? You know, or as a blank, how does it affect me? So I'm wondering, Gina, when you're talking about this, are there ever Irish people that are like fighting Irish? Like that's close to my personal identity. This is something that's important to me. Is it misrepresented, appropriated, commodified in any way here? That's just the question I asked myself as I was probably sitting there like watching football one day, <laughs> thinking about you know, cultural appropriation. I was like, oh yeah, there are other mascots. They happen to be you know, rac the racial construction of whiteness, um, potentially. So is it different there? Um, just a good question. So good comment. We're actually having this conversation on our campus because we just got a mascot like, uh. last year. And we went through. Um, with the marketing company designing and what should it look like and the finished product what were the Bethel College pilots. Mm. Um, and he's whiter than white. And so for mm. a lot of the students when he came up in Chapel, everyone was like, what? Mm. Like, okay, wow, like this mm. conversation. Sure, like sure. Yeah. Sorry, there's another another summary thought back here. Sorry. Um, I wanted some clarification on what you meant by dominant culture. Um I think uh, you know racially white in this case. Um, so the hi I think the history of mascots, I think traditionally has been around the Native uh, American Indian Indigenous community. Um, so the the current dominant racial culture of, of white identity. Could you run that by me one more time? Yeah. So looking at dominant culture institutionally, statistically of the United States, um, being white dominant culture. Sure. I think in, in looking at kind of racial ethnic identity specifically, I think there are multiple identities, intersections of identities that you can look at that have historical context around dominance. Um, but um, this is, I guess, with the mascot piece is looking at probably more racial and ethnic identity. Good question. Um, I think it's also important to state that there is a very distinctive difference between um, racial identity and ethnic identity. Sure. Sure. And whiteness in itself, what is that? Besides dominant culture, what is that? That is power. Right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Dominance, dominance means power. Yeah. Right? Sure. So appropriation of a culture that is already dominant mm -hmm. and that's already in power, like, I don't think that necessarily truly equates to, like, the minstrelsy of, you know, certain things from black culture or, like, um, the appropriation of certain yep. tribes. Um, like, sure, like that is not okay also because you are mimicking someone's ethnic identity. When you say that, what are you pointing to? I'm pointing to fighting Irish. Okay. Um, but I think there's a very serious pause and consideration that needs to happen when we're talking about dominant culture. I mean, like that. Sure. What you got up there. Absolutely, which is why I have, I, I think, it, if you remember, I have them in different categories because I think even on the top, I think there's some nuanced distinctions, right? So, and then I talked about the reality of being in the racial majority for, for these two mascots. So I agree, I totally agree with everything you said. 
Um, and I do think there's a distinctive between looking at ethnic identity and power as well. Because, I mean, for a lot of also like non-white racial identities, a lot of their ethnicities and racial identities um, coincide. And it's not necessarily something that they can distance themselves from. Sure. It's a lot more violent, the yeah. creation of their racial identities. Yep. Great. Mm -hmm. like they're both in like power stances yeah caricatures there's a history around that representation as well great yeah thanks good thoughts any other summary thoughts from maybe the side of the room about these questions I think we've kind of addressed them but yeah go for it we'll go I just I love sports, I'm a huge sports fan, so looking at mascots, of course there's been tons and tons of uh, questions being raised about um, the football team uh, on the far left, and is that appropriate? And some people are like, it doesn't matter, it's just a name, but yeah, it does matter. It's, it's what it symbolizes and putting a slur in there, though at times it's like, it's just the football team, it's just, it's all right. Sure. Looking past that, like, no, what is it, like, just because I'm not Indian does not mean it does not affect me. But it does because it should affect everybody. Um, and then looking at the Cleveland Indian baseball uh, teams, I actually never realized that like it's just the same as the other one. But this is actually they painted him red. And like I think to an average person, we're, we're not offended. But if I know if uh, if I was Indian, I would have straight up just been like, no, that's not right. Like that's not right. But after you bring it up, it's it's really interesting looking at everything. And at least like the Florida State Seminoles and the other one's kind of like a better representation, I think. It still, right. it's, it's kind of crazy just to realize and like step back and like, what if, what if that was my culture up there? How would they represent it? Yeah. yeah, good thoughts. I don't have an answer to either of these two questions. I'm just raising them and kind of helping us wrestle through them. Because um, I, honestly, I, I think for me, I was having the conversation in my own head about appropriation with Native American mascots. And then I was trying to play devil's advocate to myself, and I came up with these two thoughts. And I agree. I, I think there's a difference given power, looking at power structures and r the racial identity as well. So we're going to move on because we got a lot more to cover, but we can have some more conversation after. I do um, a couple, two points I want to make. Um, you hear the term politically correct a lot and when you're trying to have conversations around diversity. I always say this to my students. I say, it's not a, as about being politically correct. And my, my high school friends who are sports fans, they probably don't care about, like you were saying, like it's not a big deal, it's just a sports team. Um, but I hope, first of all, us as um, global citizens can, citizens can think about the identity of other people, put ourselves in their shoes, but also as believers, as we think about people that are historically marginalized in our society, you know, how we as believers can represent with and empathize with the pain and the misrepresentation, commodification, appropriation. Um, so that's one piece. Um, um, so in terms of politically correct, I really prefer the term, I think it's more about being socially conscious than it is about being reactive to say, oh, I don't want to say these things, but educating yourself and understanding historical context, um, issues of power and institutional systemic issues. So being socially conscious in summary, not politically correct. I don't really care for the term politically correct because it's reactive and it's this constructed idea, but it's more about being socially conscious. And I think all of us as human beings, the more socially conscious we are, the better we are as neighbors, citizens, but also as believers too. Um, and then the second piece, there's a long history. This is an ongoing conversation, so I kind of purposely stirred up a controversial topic around mascots to get you engaged. But yes, um, Stanford Cardinals changed their mascot. There's a history of um, St. John's, they're now called the Red Storm. They changed their mascot. So there's a history of a lot of organizations looking at going through this process of changing mascots. Um, so there's, these are just, this is just the tip of the iceberg in that conversation. Um, but I just wanted to bring that up as the first kind of, you know, where's the line? So this brings up this theme. It's hard to draw where the line is. Are, you, you know, are we starting to cross it even with the Fighting Irish or the Patriots or even maybe the Boston Celtics? Maybe an argument could be made. Great. I'm going to go on to the next topic. So appropriation of different cultural pieces. Um, so this is primarily representing a lot of Asian culture. By the way, Happy New Year for those who celebrate the Lunar New Year. Um, 
So this is a, a great example, conical shaped haps, which are really popular, um, I think, for representing. This is, again, huge basketball fan. Is, is anyone know who this is? This is one of the first that I remember as a kid seeing, you know, had um, eight, like Chinese figures. It's Marcus Camby, played for the Knicks. Um, maybe a little before your time. You guys are like, who's that? Um, <laughs> So Marcus Camby had these tattoos. They're really popular. You see David Beckham here has them, you know, highlighting maybe his abs. I'm not sure. <laughs> so Gwen Stefani is wearing a bindi. So this um, commodification of Eastern culture. Oh, this is popular. This is in style. Um, and then, of course, Katy Perry. I don't remember what award show this was at, but there was like kind of this geisha-ish type theme that was happening. Um, so these are things in pop culture that are happening right now. Just another example. This was just a couple weeks ago in light of Chinese New Year, Lunar New Year. Um, you, some of you may have seen this article on Facebook. Does anyone know what store this came from? Anyone see it? No? So this was actually at Bloomingdale's. It's a retail store. CC 2015, they were recognizing the New Year. You know, it's just, it's just hats, but I think if this is, if this is maybe personal to your identity, your, your country, et cetera, um, it might be like, really, is that necessary to Minimize or it's reductionistic oftentimes. Mm -hmm. Sure. That's just when they're right? right. So it's I, I, these are common and probably in Southeast Asia. I know I went. So I did a program called Semester at Sea. It's a study abroad program on a ship that goes around the world. I, I struggled with appropriation all the time because we were traveling. And I do this. I'm, I, I had to really critically think about being a tourist and buying souvenirs from that country that represent your country. We went to Vietnam and. You know, it was tough for me because we had our, we had a ship of 700 students. They were predominantly white, more affluent. It's an expensive program to go on. I don't know if anyone's heard of Semester at Sea. Um, and so, and then like we we're all getting back on the ship. There's just a line of people with all these like conical shaped hats, and a lot of them happened to be intoxicated. I think it was disrespectful to the country and the, that port city, how they were interacting with the country. But I wrestled with this a little bit as well. Um, this representation of your culture for the lunar year. I'm sure many, raise your hand if your college just this past week had something for Lunar New Year. Something at the dining hall, something your Asian cultural group maybe had something? Not many. Maybe a few, okay. Um, so just to be thinking about that, that's the practical application for college campuses. How are you recognizing and celebrating people's culture um, with um, you know, doing it in a genuine nature that's respecting and doing that um, yeah, with um, an authentic desire to celebrate them? Um, I, so a quick plug for this, again, if you want to learn more about this, there's a video that was made 15 years ago at Berkeley in their ethnic studies department. I just found this again in my work. I'm like, how do I respond to this? I'm trying to educate myself. There's a video called Yellow Apparel. It was made by probably ethnic studies students at Berkeley. Um, and it's on Vimeo. You can just literally Google Vimeo Yellow Apparel and it'll come right up. It's a 30 minute documentary that talks essentially about the commodification about Eastern cultural pieces. A lot of clothing talks about bindis. Henna tattoo is another one that comes up, right? It's becoming popular. Um, so this is a great resource for you if you want to write this down. Um, if anyone here is working with like Asian student associations or Asian, A Asian API, Asian Pacific Islander groups, show this video at one of your meetings and talk about it. Have good conversations with your, your peers about how is API identity represented on your campus. Um, how can you think critically and create awareness around um, cultural appropriation, naming it and identifying it? So this is just a good resource. I was thinking about showing you a clip from it. It's really old, so it is old, but I think it's good because it's it's naming naming it. Um, so quickly, the next the next one came up. Hip hop, rap has come up. This was this past year, I believe. The conversation, Iggy Azalea, I think is her name. I'm not really um, up to speed with all the pop culture, um, but the conversation I believe was. I think she won some type of award at a, a music show for like best hip hop album or something. Um, and then um, Forbes, it says, declared that um, hip hop is being run by a white blonde Australian woman. Um, and then there is, I actually heard um, there's an author named Jeff Chang. He wrote a book called Can't Stop, Won't Stop, A History of the Hip Hop Generation. He just wrote a new book called um, Who We Be, The Colorization of America. And I heard him speak at UCSB just last month. And he addressed, he actually wrote a response to this. Azalea Banks is, I think there was like a Twitter war. She started really calling her out for appropriation and mis, kind of misappropriation of hip hop um, and what hip hop means um, to a community, the history of hip hop, um, and it being 
And I think she had this comment where she got emotional in this interview, and she was like, I just feel like um, hip hop is something that a lot of the black community holds on to as um, that's connected to the history. And then she said something like, I feel like our history is being erased or something like that. And it was, it was a powerful moment of kind of vulnerability to represent, I think, the complexity of, of feeling like something is being taken, um, you know, misappropriated, essentially. So yes, this came up as well. Um, this will play in as well. We're going to address some higher level um, issues that will come up in theme parties around um, hip hop culture as well. Um, this is a this is really practical. I just saw this on like a random Facebook picture, and it seems harmless, probably well intended. Their kid is involved. Um, this is just another one. This was a picture. This was on Cinco de Mayo. You know, people want to celebrate, so some people were like, "Oh, maybe let's go to El Torito and you know have have some drinks and wear sombreros." But again, is it a, an authentic representation? Is it something in your heart that, that you really want to know more about? Educate yourself about, learn about. This was harmless. This is just you know, as someone's kid. Um, but it's not necessarily, so this concept of intent versus impact is something that I talk about in my work a lot. I'm not, your intent may have been a little bit ignorant or misinformed, but the impact is that some people may look at this and say, I mean, really, is this reducing my, something that's deeply personal to my identity as Mexican American or Chicano or Latino and, and minimizing it to a quick, fun picture for you with your, you know, with your kid. So just to kind of, personal example. So this is getting a little personal. I was like, maybe I should skip over this slide. On my, on my campus, there's a ministry that does um, outreach work in Mexico. Um, Westmont is, um, is, is probably white campus. We report that we're about 28% students of color. Fields, a lot of times, more like 15%. Um, we have a, um, a ministry that does work in Mexico. They essentially um, when they graduate, they, they, as a group, decided to wear these stoles that have the Mexican flag. Here's a picture of it. I'll just show it really quick. Um, so this was at graduation, and it has like the colors of the Mexican flag. And I think for me, my question is, how do our students from Mexico that are Mexican-American look at that? Because the group is predominantly white, the, the ministry team that goes down and does this. And they do great work. They're, they do amazing work building houses, um, VBS ministries with the community in Antonio. They have a great relationship with the pastor there. It's just like when you come back onto your campus, is, uh, you know, could that be perceived as misappropriation? Is it necessary? You know, could it be exploitative? Um, so yeah, there's some kind of, a, there's a picture of their advertisement um, that they do recruiting for on our campus. Does anyone else have anything like this on your campus? Kind of um, ministries that maybe highlight some of this outreach? OK, we'll move on. Um, <laughs> OK, so this is, I guess this is my question. So this is, talk, talk about your own college campuses for a second. So take another few minutes to talk about your own college campuses. Um, do you see cultural appropriation happening? In what forms? And why do you feel like it's happening on your campuses? So break up again to your groups of two to four and just have this conversation.
是。No, I don't think so. <laughs> sometimes it just was it. Uh, sometimes I just uh, when you pull, it, it just, you just switch it. Yeah, I just it's dumb, but it no just, worries. Uh, I appreciate you seeing me struggling. Oh no, no man, I've had to use this classroom a lot. So. <laughs> Great. Yeah. I go back. What was your name again? Uh, I'm Dr. Joshua Smith. Joshua. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Are you a professor here? Yeah, I teach English. I actually teach a class on cultural appropriation in the N-word in oh. literature and film. So. Maybe you should be up here. I don't no, know. No, no, no. <laughs> I got notes. So. Okay, I appreciate I'm, that. I'm going to be quoting you in my class. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, we're going to bring it back. Bring it back really quick. Can wrap up those conversations. All right. So I'm going to answer both of these questions here. Do you can wrap wrap up those conversations? Great. Thanks. Um, I'd love to hear what can we give, hear some examples? Maybe of, is this happening on your campus? In what forms? Anyone just want to give? Just keep them relatively concise. Um, I know you can go into telling a long story, but like any exa quick examples of how these are happening on your campus? Anyone? Uh, and you can say your name and, and, and institution. Sharon Pepperdine. Okay. Um, so we have um, cultural heritage dinners mm -hmm. um, every month of you know, whatever culture is being, is being celebrated that month. Um, she says before it was, it was not as it before they were um, put on by not the culture that we were celebrating. Okay. And now we have the students who um, actually who identify. Yeah. yeah. Sure. I, I work with the cultural clubs that help gotcha. put it on, and we just work as. Gotcha. Clubs, so I think it's really Great. Thanks, Sharon. I mean, that's a huge point that Sharon brings up. It's like, it's different. It's about almost like an in-group conversation. It's like who, who is representing this event, or you know. So it's kind of that's a big part of it as well. Who's doing it? Who's, it's almost like some language, you know, you know, a lot of people with using a word um, that has a historical context, like can this community use it in group versus out of group, that conversation. Um, that's a very complex conversation, so we won't go there. Any other examples? Yeah, say your name again. Okay, good example. So even just in a marketing campaign or for something. And they changed it. They okay. Like a day later. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, just kidding. So just, just curious, if, if you don't mind me asking, what office was putting on this, this thankfulness? Pastor's office? No worries. We don't need to call them out. I was just curious. It's a thank you day where you like write notes to Oh yeah, okay. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. So it's like a campus wide thing, it was a really big deal. So that we all thought we were like, oh my goodness. Like This is an example of a part of a marketing campaign, maybe a correlation to thankfulness culture around that. Interesting. That's a great example though. Any other examples?
sure. A lot, of, a lot of missions work. There's, I went, actually went to a presentation that Ivan Chung, he used to work on this campus with international students. He around like foreign escapism, but you know, kind of exoticizing some something about someone's culture. It's part of the tourism industry when countries are representing, you know, an artifact or an object that represents your culture, um, whether it's a conical shaped hat, you know, or a sombrero, you know. Those, but it becomes, you know, there's that thin line, right? Again, if you're Using that to recruit people for an emissions organization or something. Is, is that necessary is sometimes my question. So great. One more example, anyone? OK. So the example she said was speak with an accent day through a study abroad office. Yeah, I mean, that's. That's just the slippery slope there. Um, so it's a good example, but can, you, can we be thinking more consciously and critically before we make these decisions? You know, as RAs, before we do programs for our sections or our floors, or as an office, as, as we do ministry. Um, if you were in chapel this morning, Chad and Michaela were talking about how can we effectively preach the gospel across cultures if we're just very ignorant and not thinking about the sensitivity around that. So we have one more. Mm -hmm. But predominantly made up of white students. Mm -hmm. So how does that interface with the big popular black students? It's a good job, but kind of like the hip hop thing. Yeah. It's a cultural identification piece sure, for sure. black students. And not that they're, if they would call it another name, uh, Voices of Praise, right. which could, or something else, sure. they probably would be fine with it. Right. That's not. Right. Great. I mean, great example. Um, if you're coming from Christian institutions, which I think is a lot of us, chapel is one that comes up for us at Westmont all the time. Like we have, you know, we we have a speaker that's a person of color, a black African American speaker, and then it's like we're suddenly doing gospel music this week. Um, but and and then it's hard. It's our, I'm friends with our campus um, worship director. It's hard because you want to represent some diverse forms of worship. Um, the timing of that, do you infuse it in? You know, how do you engage in that effectively without doing it exploitatively, in a sense, is a, is a question that comes up. Great, great example, Joe. Thanks for sharing that. So hopefully these give you some tangible examples of your own campuses. This is good that you're thinking about, oh, yeah, I've seen this in this office. This marketing campaign was a little bit odd and made me feel a little bit weird. So just good tangible examples here. Um, so I just, OK, oh, so really quick, did anyone address this other question? Why is this happening? So why the fortune cookie? You know, why um, the speak with an accent day? Like, what, what's, the prob what's the problem here? Any, any thoughts on that? Anyone? Yeah, you can jump in. Mm. Yeah. I'm gonna, that's a really great point. I'll throw out a question that I've wrestled with, another question that I'm going to raise and not answer, which is, as I've done this work, and so we see it in comedy, so Dave Chappelle, Chris, a lot of comedians talk about race. Um, a lot of up-and-coming Asian com comedians will talk about you know, their racial and cultural identity. My question is this simply, um, is, uh, is at times humor 
um, used as a coping mechanism for hard issues around justice, injustice, racism, right? Oh, it's easier to just laugh it off and make fun of it. And that's why I wrestled with the, the role of humor. Um, so that's come up as well. So any other comments about why? Okay. I just want to come up. Oh yeah, sure, sure. I think, I think it also has to do with the skill level. Mm -hmm. um, so I remember there was, uh, it's a last song, I think Rick Warren had made a comment about uh, mm -hmm. something with respect to the Asian American mm -hmm. community. I was teaching a course and I had a student try to address that. And then she brought up a comedian who deals with racial issues all the time. But I think Sorry. people who do this for a living can get away with things who, for the people who don't do comedy for a living, like a comedian knows the audience, knows nuance, there's there's a lot of intelligence involved. Not to, not to take them off the hook, but they don't. Sure, sure. But I think skill level is, is something to consider. Yeah. I think often comedians are good at inverting it so that you're realizing, wow, that's wrong. Like, yes. tre like Trevor Noah is a, you know, I think, I just, I just saw him in Chicago, and he did a really good job of inverting it so that mm. you're laughing, but you're like, wow, that is horrible. Like, yeah. Right. So I think there are a lot of conscious comedians that are raising awareness around injustice through humor. I think that's a little bit different. Kamal Bell is one. He has something called the Kamal Bell Curve. He calls it ending racism in about an hour. And it's a, it's a comedy show using humor, but I think he's, I think he's coming from a critical, con critical consciousness lens um, versus just perpetuating stereotypes to get some cheap laughs in a sense, right? So humor is another one. So that's a good example of perhaps why you see this on our college campuses. Sure, sure. Any other last thoughts on why? Why, this, why is this happening? Back here. I think it has to do with some of what you talked about. You've been in a place, you identify with it. If you started in a place, you identify with it. But it, it, that, that the power dynamic of I'm in a position, well, I may be people coming to me all the time, so it's okay for me to do it mm -hmm. because I'm in with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good thoughts. Zach, did you have something, Zach? Yeah, um, at my institution, we recently had something similar to that of wearing the sombreros, that whole mm -hmm. picture. And I forgot to share this with my group, but um, I did ask, ask some of my Hispanic students how they felt about it. And, um, or well, my coworkers had asked some of our Hispanic students how they would feel about it. And they just, laugh. They got a kick out of it. You know, it was a great time. So um, my question was, I mean, were this, is it students perpetuating it of that culture? And I think that most definitely could probably go hand in hand with the generational thing. 
you know, maybe they're just like, oh, well, you know, it's all in good fun, putting on a sombrero and things like that, whereas you have someone who's like, that's offensive. So I think maybe an issue could lie with the students in that particular generation. Yeah. I think that's also tied to consciousness as well, as well as my first, the question I posed, like, is it easy to just use humor as a coping mechanism? It's like, this is, makes me feel comfortable. I'm in a probably white context here, and then there's a picture, but I'm just going to laugh it off because I don't want to, it's like, I mean, like real, like in the heart, I don't want to deal with it here and wrestle through it and raise a stink about it. Um, but I think, so there's a lot of things going on there that's complex about our own development, um, regardless of what our identity is. So I think we can become more socially conscious in that process. Cool, we have a lot more, I'm going to jump through some slides here because I have a lot more examples for you here. There's a lot of appropriation, I think, in, in our society. I, here's some questions just to ask um, that I think are really helpful on our campus. If you, you know, you're having a conversation with this organization or that office um, or a student group that's maybe doing this, context and history, how important is that? So uh, looking, is there a historical context of oppression, minimization of the identity, et cetera? Um, earlier, sorry, what was your name? Iman. Iman was talking about power, right? Is there a historical power situation here where someone is being marginalized or historically oppressed? And I think that gives some context. And I think. Um, some of the argument for some of the mascots is that there's not a power issue there or a historical um, oppression. So thinking about the context and the history of this identity. What is the climate of your environment, your campus, your student demographics? A couple times I've talked about, you know, it, how, is this, how would this be received on a campus that's maybe a His Hispanic serving institution, HSI um, is the category that you use, that's like over 40% Latino and you're, and you're having that Versus, I talk about Westmont, I'm like, we are very white. And you understand contextually how that comes across um, to a small number of students that identify with that identity. So what is the climate? What is your, um, your campus environment like, is another question. And then we, we, this was a, in the first quote, is talking about respect, or early quote. Is this a respectful representation of a culture? It's a simple question to ask. Whether you're looking at a mascot or a tattoo, um, or a cultural artifact that you're wearing, et cetera. Uh, another question, does this illustrate a genuine appreciation and respect of the culture? It's more nuanced. And then th another question is, could this be perceived as exploitative? Other, you know, like this is just being used for your campaign or marketing or, um, you know, we're just using this for a different reason. So it's um, kind of exploiting someone's culture for a personal gain. So just some good questions to ask student organizations, student government, if these things are coming up on your campus. Great, so I'm gonna qu quickly touch on the, this concept someone mentioned of themed parties. So you know, all of us go to parties, sometimes there's a theme, whether, you know, 80s parties, they're kind of fun, you get to dress up, certain dress, and so I think there's, a, there, I'm trying to inductively think about this, I'm like, why um, are these things, keep, they keep surfacing in our country um, around, um, theme parties, but I can get, I understand that having a theme to a party makes it more fun, right? Costume party, that's why I think Halloween has become very popular. So I'm just going to go over in recent years, and I'm going to briefly touch on my presentation a couple years ago, I actually looked at social media and the role, because you see it now, it's right on your phone, you're like, oh, another racist party, here it is on Facebook, there's an article about it. Um, so I'm just going to jump through, um, I realize that the, the dates may not be correct, because I presented this two years ago. Um, this was a, a of a gathering that happened at Penn State. Um, it was for, with a sorority, and they had a basically, I don't know what that means, but it was um, like a, a Mexican type theme party. Literally, these, these signs say, I don't cut grass, I smoke it, will mow lawn for weed and beer. Um, just completely disrespectful. Um, you know, ho a horrible representation. I'm sure whatever um, national organization this was, the Greek organization, it went up to the national level, they had to address it, but um, this came out on Twitter. Again, this is another piece, it makes it instantaneously visible to the world. That's when you just screenshot things, because before it gets erased, right? Just like capture it, right? And that's what happens, because I'm sure these things got erased once they realized that people were offended by it, um, which unfortunately doesn't see, take ownership of their own actions, but this is another one that happened a couple years ago at Duke, um, which, um, it was an Asian theme party from Kappa Sigma, so the the chapter there got suspended. There was a, I think they called it, um, 
literally, racist was the title of, of, their, of their gathering, right? So these things happening on college campuses. I went to school down the road from here. I mentioned, I think maybe I went, I went to NC State. Um, that campus is one of the more diverse in terms of API representation on the East Coast. It's around 20% Asian American students. So to me, I like just, um, I know Zach was talking about your own, the own identity being like, that's not a big deal. I'm just going to make fun of it. I mean, that just, that kind of blows my mind there. But that was another example. Did anyone ever remember seeing this on Facebook, articles about this? Anyway, so there's some of these out there. This one happened at a University of Florida. Um, it brings up this concept of blackface. There's a history behind the concept of blackface. Um, but this one, I don't know what this one was called. Um, but we'll get into um, a common trend around kind of um, hip hop appropriation in theme parties as well. Um, this one, very close to home for us, just happened, I want to say, two years ago. Um, does anyone remember what camps this was from? It says it on there, but UC Irvine did a video. It was on YouTube, and they had someone that was representing this part of the song. I think they were supposed to be Jay-Z, and it was actually an Asian American male. It's actually an Asian Amer an API fraternity, and he was in blackface, and there's a historical context behind that. Didn't recognize that. Um, so Lambda Theta Delta, you know, this came to the national level. This was on YouTube. Um, and it was basically like a lip sync to, to this. I think it was Suit and Tie. Justin Timberlake, great. So does anyone remember this? This was really close to home, Irvine. Um, so maybe our Christian bubbles were not engaging with this as much. In my circles, people are, I mean, this was, people are talking about this. This is a generating a lot of conversation. I just want to give an example of how colleges are responding to this. Some of my colleagues at San Jose State um, did a program called Modern Blackface Cultural Pre Appreciation or Appropriation. Um, so you can see how are people responding to these things. Create conversation on your, on your campuses um, where you can talk about the history of appropriation, block, blackface, and what the history of that is. Um, so just an example, um, some of my colleagues at San Jose State University were addressing this. And this just happened, as you can see, this just happened this past February. This was like last week. I just saw it on Facebook, so I just put it into this presentation. OK, so this is one that was very much in the news, because it, the, UC, the UC system very much responded to it. Does anyone remember the Compton cookout at UCSD? It's five years ago. Um, I used to work at this institution. A lot of the UCs are hovering around 1% to 2% black students, very low percentage of black students. Um, so this is an actual screenshot of the Facebook invitation in the right corner there. Um, it was called a Compton Cookout. It was held, I believe, by a Greek letter organization that was predominantly white. Um, and they basically had a theme party um, based on stereotypes of what Compton is or what their perception of it um, is. And I don't think that you know, the university had to intervene. I don't think the party happened. Um, but the community was outraged. I think black students on that campus in the 1% are like, this is unacceptable on a campus that this is happening. How are we addressing this and how are we letting this happen to organizations that are um, sponsored by the, the university? So um, does anyone, um, so does, raise your hand if you remember this. A little bit before time, maybe for some of your students. So, th so what happened was all across the UCs from Berkeley down to um, UCSD people were protesting. I think black students, students of color, white students that were like, this is unacceptable. We need to do something about this in our system. We're protesting up and down the coast of California. So it was really good to see um, some response to that. All right, this is more recent. Raise your hand if you've seen this movie. OK? Dear White People was written, directed by Justin Simeon, pretty young um, black male um, writer, film producer. Um, there's a quick screenshot. I think this was from a scene in the movie. There was essentially, if you saw at the end of the movie, it referenced this. Um, and it, I don't want to give the movie away, but it's a story of, I think they're, uh, yeah, being a black face in a white place. Um, so the movie kind of culminates in a scene like this, which was uh, a theme party like at UCSD, the Compton Cookout. So Justin Simeon actually uses something that happened at UCSD five years ago in his movie that. These are happening on a lot of um, predominantly white campuses, also known as PWIs. Um, so this film, I, I think it doesn't necessarily address appropriation as much as uh, just kind of racial issues. 
um, and the complexity of racial identity. I think Justin Simeon does a really good job of looking at the complexities in, in these characters. But at the end of the film, it kind of culminates in a theme party. So I just kind of threw that in there. Um, so these are just questions I raise in light of social media as well. Um, do these parties, comments, thoughts exist just as frequently in the past? Why is this happening, surfacing so much more in the past five years? Um, does social media have a role with that? Like I said, you're getting it like, oh, people are, are this is like trending, or people are tweeting about this party, and it's putting, put, kind of putting it out there. And then, can this exposure from social media be used to create awareness and educate? So can we use social media for a positive, for educating, for deconstructing, and um, reconstructing our thoughts and critical consciousness around um, appropriation and culture. Um, and uh, I'll give a quick example. Some of my colleagues at USF, University of San Francisco, did, created a page. Actually, this is going to another kind of tangent, but um, there was a trend where the schools were having confessions pages. Is anyone familiar with this? <laughs> Westmont confessions, Biola confessions, and then inevitably some really ignorant things will be said there about marginalized communities. Um, and USF started, um, I think, they started a, uh, like a, a similar um, campaign, but it was like identifying microaggressions on campus. And it gave people voice to, these are ignorant things that I've heard on this campus about my identity. And it, so it's using, it's kind of reversing this trend of social media to educate. So we're really short on time, so I'm just going to jump ahead here. So the question is, would something at, like at UCSD happen on your campus, a Christian college? And I asked my students this, who I just, you know, because this happened from, from, for me just recently. I was talking to my students. They're like, I, I don't think that would happen at Westmont. You know, that, that, type, of, that type of party. Well, it did. Um, this was a Facebook my, for my own personal Facebook. <laughs> um, this is my work Facebook, by the way. I have two separate ones. Um, they called it a ghetto fab party. Let me just contextualize a couple of things. It was not on campus. It was primarily Westmont alum who had graduated. And, but there was one host that was a current student. The average age of the students hosting were probably 25, 26. Um, so it was not similar to UCSD in that sense, because it was not an organization like a fraternity. Um, it was, so in some senses, it's like, it could have been like, this isn't our business, because off campus, it's not Westmont students, although there was Westmont student, one Westmont student. But this is what happened. Um, there's expletives even in the invitation. I won't read that. I just wanted to contextualize that this did happen on our campus. We had to respond to it. Um, this happened in 2012. It was my first year. This was what smacked me in the face. I'm like, OK, time to get to work and address this on our campus. Because my question is, why is this happening for our students, and it's a small school, 200 students, what in their mind for these graduates are saying, this is OK for me to do? Like, this is OK, right? I'm, I don't think this is a problem. I'm just going to have this, invite um, you know, 75 of my, of my friends. And it's a public Facebook event. So this brings, for me, this brought up the question, intent versus impact. How many people saw this invitation? Maybe, you know, on Facebook, you see, oh, my friend's going to this. And you're like, I want to click on it. Just, 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 I'm curious. I'm Facebook stalking them. I'm a little nosy, right? So I, I'm guessing 150, 200, 300 people saw this from Westmont. So for me, my question was, what is the impact of this on our campus? For our, we have 1% black students on our campus. For our black students that are like, how is this representing my culture? And is Westmont OK with this? Are my peers OK with this? How does that impact my psyche, my sense of belonging? at Westmont, at Biola, at Wheaton. So those are the questions I asked. I'm going to skip through. We, I, I kind of talk a little bit in detail about how we responded to it. Um, in, I would say, in summary, OK, I'm just going to leave this up, because you're going to read that. I don't want to distract you. In summary, we met, we intervened. We met with a student that was currently one of the hosts. Didn't happen. We actually changed the Facebook page to try to create some dialogue around it, why it wasn't OK, because I did. I wanted to think about who saw that and, and really deconstruct that. Um, we met with a handful of students to talk to them about that and just give space to process, to acknowledge it, and to try to educate why it was wrong and why it was a misappropriation, why it was ignorant, and why it was in nature racist. So we did our best to address it. In reality, not many of our students knew about it. I think some of the upperclassmen maybe saw it, but it was a small number. So just addressing how, how we kind of address that. So these are three important things. If this happens on your campus, 
the, um, I think for students that are affected by this, the need to feel safe on this campus, I mentioned what did our 1% of black students feel after that happened, if, if they saw that Facebook page. Uh, the need to be heard, so talking to students, say, give them space to process some of these things, and the need to know what's next. Oh, and then another thing is we addressed, um, I think we may have, I think we tried to address, well, it might have been a different thing, but um, another incident we addressed in our chapel, which all of our students are together, and our campus pastor did a great job of saying, this is not who we are, this is not okay. Um, to, so to publicly, and I think the students really appreciated saying, the administration cares about this, and they're, they're, um, you know, they're not condoning it, they're speaking out against it. Practical example, um, these, this probably happened maybe six years ago. Ohio University did a campaign essentially against appropriation during Halloween. Has anyone seen this campaign, parts of it? Um, personally, I'm not a huge fan. I'm, I'm a stickler about language, so we're a culture. It's, I almost want to say, I think it would have been to say, this is part of my identity, not a costume or something like that, because I think it minimizes culture but, or um, reduces it. But there was a campaign that kind of went viral on color lines. I think I got this off color lines, where they're showing a picture of appropriation and they're speaking out against it and saying, this is not okay, this is personal to my identity. So Ohio University did a um, campaign. You can Google, it'll come up right away um, around Halloween time. Every Halloween, appro appropriation comes up, right? Are you seeing racist costumes <laughs> at your Halloween gatherings? This is a question that comes up. Um, so we're getting close to time. So these are other questions for discussion. Um, how are they impacting your campus climate? How can we be prepared to train and support our community when a bias-related incident happens or cultural appropriation occurs? And what are strategies that we can proactively educate and engage the campus community to be more socially conscious? The earlier question I said, wh why is this happening? Can we create a campus where that's not okay? I, I would say to my students sometimes, if this happened at UCSB, it wouldn't happen at UCSB because you know you can get away with it. Because maybe the, AP, the Asian American community would be like, no, that's not okay. Or the Latino community might be like, no, that's a misappropriation of our culture. Um, but why is this happening maybe on Christian campuses in small, nuanced examples? So um, can we create a socially conscious campus that's not allowing this to happen? So this is my summary slide just um, as, we, as we wrap up. Um, kind of three things, three steps. The power of naming, I talked about that. It allows you to see it, you become conscious of it, and you can recognize it when it's happening. Hopefully when you leave this workshop, you'll be more conscious of it and you'll see examples of it. With, it happens with your friends, maybe even with your families who unintentionally are appropriating things. Addressing it, how do you respond to it versus saying, we talked about some students, even of that own identity, might laugh it off and say, oh, yeah, it's kind of funny, I'm not gonna make a big deal of it. Or can you address it more effectively and say that's not okay, so speak out against it. <coughs> and that's closely tied to educating. Creating an environment where we can be proactive about being, about being culturally and socially conscious instead of being reactive. Like, oh crap, there was another racist party, how are we gonna deal with it? <coughs> but can you say, no, this campus is having dialogue about this to educate people, it's creating more consciousness around it. So these are just takeaway steps. Um, to, to think about that on our own campuses. It's a lot of work because um, I think developmentally people, it's easier to avoid it than to address it. Um, so I just would acknowledge that. Um, here's some, some of the resources I had. Um, I think the lunch is at noon, correct? So I was told to finish 10 minutes early. Um, any last concise comments for the group? Does anyone want to say any last things? We can take maybe two questions, if anyone has questions for me or for the group. Anyone? I think sure. oftentimes when things happen, we're quick to be angry and kind of mm. like, this mm. is obviously unjust. And it, I think oftentimes we like being with people who are, like don't understand what they've done wrong. We sort of leave them in the dust and we're just mad and we're not gonna continue. And I feel like we, I don't know, how, yeah. Like well, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, so you know, I've heard two schools of thought because sometimes, actually, within my own culture, I don't want to perpetuate stereotypes. I think within the API community, there's this sense of harmony that's valued in Eastern culture where it's like, I don't want to raise a big stink about it. So for me, like, there's a blog, Angry Asian Man, I think is what it's called. Uh, Phil Yu managed that blog. Anger is a, an appropriate response to injustice and to 
racism at times, right? So I don't want to minimize the reality of being angry. And as, as a believer, you know, I think there's, there's a piece there where you, we need to show grace um, with our brothers and sisters as we learn together. So there's a nuanced kind of balance of that. Um, and I think sometimes the nice thing kind of doesn't necessarily get through either to some people that are appropriating because they're like, oh, they seem to be okay with it. So sometimes anger, I would say, is effective in saying, that's not okay, and that upsets me. Um, but doing it in a loving way. I think as a diversity educator or as a, anyone that's a socially conscious citizen, I think doing it in a way that's out of love, I think as a believer, is, is the most effective way in addressing these things. It's a great question, because how, you know, how do we respond to these things? Good question. One more question. Sure. Yeah, I think that's part of being socially conscious about many identities and how we as believers can be empathetic and conscious to people that are marginalized, whatever it is, the identity, ability, class, gender, things like that. So good, good thoughts. Great. I'm going to, um, thanks for coming here. I hope it was helpful. Hopefully you can take away some pieces. I have cards up here if, if you want to grab them. Um, if you want like a copy of the presentation or anything for your campus. Biola University offers a variety of biblically centered degree programs ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.